This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. The 1990s seem to be proving what W.E.B. Du Bois predicted back in 1903, that race relations would be the central problem of the 20th century. We see racial controversies in politics, the justice system, education, and even the arts. Last week, before a full house at New York's Town Hall, the esteemed theater critic Robert Brustein, who is white, and Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright August Wilson, who is African-American, debated racial politics in American theater. If you follow the arts, you've probably read about it. Now you can hear it for yourself. The event, entitled On Cultural Power, was sponsored by American Theatre Magazine, which is published by the Theatre Communications Group, an organization that represents nonprofit theaters. The debate was moderated by playwright and performer Anna DeVere Smith. Brustein and Wilson's public disagreement began after Wilson's address at a Theatre Communications Group conference last June. Wilson pointed to the lack of African-American theater companies and claimed that only African-Americans are equipped to write or direct theater about African-Americans. Furthermore, he said that African-Americans betray their cultural identity when they perform in so-called colorblind roles. Brustein responded in print by condemning what he described as Wilson's poisonous racial consciousness. We'll hear excerpts of last week's opening remarks from Brustein and Wilson followed by their responses to questions from the audience. First, Robert Brustein, theater critic for The New Republic and artistic director of the American Repertory Theater in Cambridge, Massachusetts. If I understand August Wilson's position correctly, he regards theater partly as an avenue to political and cultural power, a medium through which a large, disadvantaged class can dramatize its past injustices and perhaps find redress through changes in the social or political system. Starting with Plato, who you know banished the artist from his ideal republic, utopianists, even the best of them, have usually ended in suppressing free artistic expression. All revolutions, as Eugene Ionesco wrote, burn the libraries of Alexandria. Today in America, we see a similar leaning in what we call political correctness, which in its overzealous crusade to purge our language of offensive terms, sometimes seems to be arguing for what one critic has called freedom from speech. (laughs) Out of a conviction that freedom of speech is essential to creative invention and critical thought, A number of modern artists, both black and white, whatever their beliefs as citizens of the state, and I must continue to emphasize that I'm talking about them as artists, not as citizens, not as political beings, have rejected the concept of art as an ideological instrument. Ideological art is dedicated either to reinforcing the existing power structure, as in totalitarian regimes, or reforming and changing it, as in most activist revolutionary expression. The alternative to ideological art was eloquently summed up by the Czech novelist Milan Kundera when he said that his artistic function was to speak truth to power. Isn't that why we revere the greatest dramatists from Aristophanes to Athol Fugard? And isn't that one of the major reasons we cherish Shakespeare, despite his occasional need to flatter the reigning English monarchs? Because they had the courage to speak truth to power. Such truth-tellers help to expose the corruptions of pomp and power by revealing the reality behind human action and human motive. In short, the workings of the human soul which has no color. The great black writer James Baldwin has been evoked already tonight. I'd like to evoke him as well. He was a friend of mine who said, at least in his early career, that he believed in speaking truth to power as well. In an essay called Everybody's Protest Novel, he wrote, let us say that truth is meant to imply a devotion to the human being it is not to be confused with a devotion to a cause, and causes, as we know, are notoriously bloodthirsty. 
Note that neither Kundera nor Baldwin seems much interested here in using the artistic process to achieve power. Indeed, behind their words is the implication that the true artist must shun power because power systems are not only not instruments of truth, they may very well be the enemies of truth. Those who believe in art as a political weapon, as a method of empowering the disadvantaged, no doubt serve a vital social function, but sometimes at a cost. A passionate political purpose occasionally obliges these artists, in my opinion, to sacrifice individual truth for the collective good. Of course, it is possible to justify such means if the right ends are achieved. But look at the downside. While the arts at best are inclusive, ideological art is exclusive. The spectator is pressured to reach conclusions coerced into choosing sides. Political art is usually a persuasive form of melodrama, the opposition of right and wrong, or shall we say black and white, when the truth is usually gray. I agree with August Wilson's appeal for more black theaters and with his plea that foundations be more supportive of such theaters, assuming they have established records. This is certainly a better cause for foundations than pouring their multi multicultural funds into efforts to diversify the audiences of mainstream theaters. In fact, I believe strongly in general operating grants from public and private sources for all theaters of proven quality. But this support cannot be viewed as a form of entitlement. Black theaters should earn their foundation and corporate funding by the same criteria of value and community support as any other. If Mr. Wilson knows of a worthy black theater that isn't being properly funded, he could give it instant recognition by rewarding it with one of his world premieres. Although I endorse the value of theaters that confine themselves to plays by black writers, I admit some difficulty in approving Mr. Wilson's appeal for the self-segregation of black artists in racial enclaves. If these artists excluded themselves from what Mr. Wilson calls the cultural imperialists and their so-called classical values of European theater, we would have been denied the Othello and Judge Brack of James Earl Jones, the Shakespearean shrew of Jane White, the Fedra of Gloria Foster, the Shakespearean monarchs enacted by Denzel Washington and Andre Brauger, the brilliant performances of Morgan Freeman, Lawrence Fishburne, and Samuel L. Jackson, indeed all the manifold achievements of non-traditional casting and true interculturalism. In fact, we would have been denied August Wilson's plays, all of which have been produced by the very mainstream nonprofit theaters he refers to as cultural imperialists. From certain of his recent letters and remarks, I suspect August would now like to modify his position. I hope so, because then there is no debate between us. But since he is also denied ever saying he would never work with a white director, I must remind him of his 1990 op-ed piece in the New York Times called I Want a Black Director where he refused to allow fences to be filmed by a white director, adding this caveat. Let's make a rule. Blacks don't direct Italian films, Italians don't direct Jewish films, Jews don't direct black American films. But as a matter of fact, one of the best films I ever saw about the black experience was directed by an Israeli named Boaz Yakin. It was called Fresh. I suspect Mr. Wilson would call this, as he once called George Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, a bastardizing of our people and our culture, but it was a very good picture. <laughs> the truth is not subject to racial generalizations. However, they serve the aims of power. Indeed, in seeking to combat stereotypes, such generalizations may create another form of error, what the noted black thinker Albert Murray called the ethnographic fallacy, where one man believes he is speaking for an entire race. If no one person can speak for black Americans, no one person can speak for white people either. 
There is no such thing as a monolithic Eurocentric culture. The greatest modern European artists have, like August Wilson, almost invariably been rebels against the existing culture, not its proselytes and flunkies. It is a principle of theatrical art that it defies generalizations, being subject, like life itself, to surprises, reversals, and contradictions. General truths, Ibsen told us, have a shelf life of about 20 years, after which they become just as tired and worn out as any other convention. We speak a lot these days of cultural diversity, but true diversity lies in acknowledging that every human being is an individual and not simply a member of a racial, ethnic, or sexual group. The variety of these individual differences is what bonds us all to the human family. Ultimately, of course, the quarrel between Mr. Wilson and myself is not just over the function of art or the function of race in the theater. It is over larger issues of inclusion versus exclusion, of integration versus separatism, which is to say the way of Martin Luther King and his followers versus the way of the early Malcolm X, Louis Farrakhan, and the Nation of Islam. A great gulf still divides the races in this country, despite the significant strides of the last 30 years. It is an obligation of all men and women of goodwill to try to bridge that gulf and complete the still unfinished racial business of our nation. But I believe America will only begin to fulfill its promise when we acknowledge that we are individuals first, Americans second, and tribalists third. When we realize that we are all the same species under the skin, when we recognize that all human beings are responsible, one for the other, every mother's child. Thank you for listening so carefully. Robert Brustein is theater critic for the New Republic and artistic director of the American Repertory Theater. We'll hear from playwright August Wilson after a break. This is Fresh Air. We're listening to excerpts of a debate on race, cultural power, and theater. Now we'll hear the opening comments of Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright August Wilson, who's African-American. His plays include Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, The Piano Lesson, Fences, Two Trains Running, and Seven Guitars. When I was invited to give the keynote address at the TCG conference in June of 1996, I at first declined because I was busy writing my new play, and as always, the requirements of art can be demanding. And as I thought about it, what I might possibly have said, I thought about the lack of black theaters with significant resources to produce a play with high production values. And as my thoughts became more focused, I realized that 65 out of the 66 Lord theaters were white. And I regretted that I had declined the invitation because I thought it was something that my colleagues in the theater needed to address. I was, of course, then pleased when I was urged to reconsider the invitation. And I am glad that I did. That 65 out of 66 Lord theaters were white meant that black theater artists were being excluded from the opportunities to develop their various talents in the same level of venues as their white counterparts. And for all the presence of myself, George Wolfe, Anna DeVere Smith, Susan Lloyd Parks, to name some of the more visible, most blacks were locked out of the house. 65 out of 66 theaters said that something was dreadfully wrong. And once accepting the challenge of speaking to the lack of black theaters, then I had to go the whole way and speak to the historical conditions that occasioned our art to be placed in the hands of someone else as custodians and to affirm the cultural battle that has been taking place since the early 17th century when we were brought to this country in chains and were perceived as being without language, art, culture, and other trappings of civilization. We all know the errors of such thought now due partly to our fierce resistance of such conditions of servitude and our equally fierce affirm affirmation of the value and worth of our being. 
We have enjoyed the privilege and the company of many whites in American society who have stood by us in making those affirmations in the spirit of friendship and brotherhood. Without them, the journey that we have made from the hull of a ship to a self-sufficient and culturally robust people could not have been possible. That is not to say that we blacks and whites do not continue to have a difficult relationship. In American society, it seems that we would sometimes rather create an illusion than to face the harsh and the uncompromising truths about ourselves. We, as a society, suffer from a failure of imagination. From the beginning of black Americans' contact with the Western world, and despite over 300 years of white cultural dominance, we are still a culturally vibrant and robust people. Our music, our verbal gymnastics, our sense of style, our unique way of seeing the world are all part of an African sensibility that informs our presence here in North America. Inside all blacks is at least one heartbeat that is fueled with the blood of Africa. Jazz is a widely acknowledged and celebrated as a uniquely American art form. But if the instruments with which jazz was created, that is European marching band instruments, had not become widely available after the Civil War, jazz as we know it would not exist. It was African sensibility coming into contact with European technology that made it possible. Imagine then the possibilities of black theater empowered with the tools necessary to create its own unique art, the resources to nurture and provide homes for talented artists in a place where your visiting past doesn't expire, usually on March 1st after Black History Month. It is important to note that we are not advocates of separatism, as Mr. Brewstein claims, but rather we are seeking to be included. In November 1994, Time magazine ran a cover story proclaiming a renaissance in black art. There was a photo of the dancer Bill T. Jones on the cover, and the caption proclaiming black artists were free at last. The theme of the story was that black artists were no longer being confined by their blackness, but were creating art that was not limited to black themes, that they had learned to transcend their blackness to pursue more universal expressions by embracing the values and norms of European culture. This universality, of course, is conferred on white artists automatically. And never, never is it suggested that white playwrights like David Mamet or Terence McNally are limiting themselves to whiteness or that they're being confined. or that they are being confined in their art by pursuing white themes. The idea that we are trying to escape from the ghetto of black culture is insulting. It is insulting to us, our parents, and our, their forebears who have fought to defend and preserve their manners and ways of life. To assimilate into the society is harmful to the cultural self as it abandons the age-old investigation and accomplice of our ancestors on the African continent and the continuance of those explorations here in the continent of North America. That our cultural contributions to what is known as American culture are many and inextricably woven into the fabric of contemporary life does not mitigate the loss, as the hegemonic concerns of the culture are not our own, and we do not participate in the privilege or the power that they produce. In other words, since the dominant culture is not our culture, we have no power, no matter what contributions we have made to its spiritual growth or to its material comfort. 
this can be a little more than disconcerting if you're standing on this side of the equation. If we choose not to assimilate, it does not mean we oppose the values of the dominant culture, but rather we wish to champion our own causes and our own celebrations, our own values and our own cherish. So that the two cultures exist concurrent with one another, two entities contributing to the perils and pillars of the society in a struggle to triumph over the vagaries of life and human conduct. I look forward to further hearing Mr. Brewstein's views and espousing further my own. You have demonstrated a willingness to explore the nature of your own lives by coming here tonight, and I salute you, and I ask that we find a common cause that can enlist us all. For in the end, it comes down to people sitting on the stage talking about life as a battlefield of the spirit and how art and life illuminate and embolden and celebrates that battle, finding in it a meaning for the weight and substance, the content and context of our lives. Thank you. Playwright August Wilson recorded last week at New York's Town Hall. The debate on race and theater continues in the second half of our show. This is Fresh Air. This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross, and we're going to return to the debate on race, theater, and cultural power recorded last week at New York's Town Hall. The speakers are Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright August Wilson, who is African-American, and critic and director Robert Brewstein, who is white. The moderator is playwright and actress Anna DeVere Smith. She's African-American and has written several plays about cultural confrontations in America and has performed in roles representing many races, religions, and ethnic groups. In the debate excerpts, we'll hear Brustein and Wilson respond to questions from the audience and from the moderator. I would like to uh, first have you respond to each other. What do you think, Bob? Would you like to respond to August while he's just finished? And then, so he can... Well, is that okay? And no, then you, fine. Because you just spoke. Okay. Um, <laughs> I have nothing but the utmost respect for what you said. And... Uh, I think you have probably the best mind of the 17th century. <laughs> you're, what you're describing is a 17th century condition, August. You're not describing a 20th century condition. You speak of, of most blacks being locked out of the house. That continues to be true, but it, was, it is not as true as it was in the 17th century. You speak, as, you speak of, of people being brought to this country in chains. That is true, and we, it is the original sin of this country. He speaks of of black people being brought to this country in chains, and that is the original sin of this nation, which, which like all original sin, will probably never be expiated. But this country is trying to expiate it. And the fact is that to declare that you have African blood in your veins 300 years you know, after you left Africa... Let me tell a little story. Um, I, I, I was just going to ask the audience to... Uh, Bear with us, okay? Um, it's, my understanding, it's my understanding that there was a night in August Wilson's play, Fences, where James Earl Jones turned around and stopped the show. Um, and so I appreciate, as we, I have stated in the beginning, that we're all here together, and I want your responses. But could you please um, um, allow each participant to speak? Indeed, the silences disturb me as much as the noise. So um, uh, let's, let's please, uh, please and, be respectful and, and of one another. In all of fairness, <laughs> I have all fairness to the audience, I find, you know, it, I find this is some of the most outrageous things I've ever heard. What, just can, now? can I finish yes, my explain it, though? Jump in, Absolutely. jump in, jump in, please. Uh, uh, <laughs> I can understand. Right? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm saying that in the same way that Lorraine Hansberry said that in Raising but, in the Sun. But you, do, you, <laughs> do, you, are, you are aware that in the 17th century, uh, we were slaves. Blacks in America were slaves. You're aware of that? Of course I'm aware of that. Okay. I find that amazing. But in, in, 19, in 1996 or 7, you are no longer slaves. Oh. And it seems to me to talk about yourself uh, as standing on the, on the ground of the slave quarters is to represent yourself as, as a 350-year-old man. The fact is things have changed over the course of the last 300 years, especially in the last 30 years. There have been some changes. And I'm just asking that we acknowledge those changes. Uh, the reason I said that uh, 
Well, well to Woye Soyinka, for example, you would not be considered an African man. He would, uh, he would reject that idea. Uh, yeah. I think all blacks in America, irrespective of, you know, very obviously, if you're going to look at me, it's obviously the slave master visited the uh, slave quarters. Okay, so it's very obvious. We're talking about uh, blacks in America are an African people. Yes. Right? They came from Africa, whatever. whatever of course you uh, did. And my, okay. my, my parents came from Poland. I don't consider myself to be Polish. Well, well that, that's you. <laughs> You right. see, that, that is you. But we are Africans, you know, and yes. if you have assimilated in society, if you have given that up, don't blame us for not for our unwillingness to do so. Okay? Uh, there was a question in here that I don't know that I actually have that was actually connected to this, though, which is a question about your own background and to what extent you recognize that part of you which is white. I recognize all of myself. First of all, my father was German. Uh, yeah, what about it? I don't know. I mean, I don't know what else to say. The cultural environment of my life is black. Uh, I make the self-definition of myself as a black man, and uh, that's all anyone needs to know. I, I've been asked, let me just, go ahead, please. Um, simply, you know, I, I also would ask, what about people of mixed blood, people of, who consider themselves multiracial. They, are not, they do not feel themselves, I would guess, represented by what you said tonight. And uh, once again, I have to emphasize that no one person can speak for an entire race. And when you speak of we, you know, it worries me. Uh, I also would want to follow that up with this notion that there is a single white culture. That David Mamet, for example, um, writes plays about the white culture. Is, is sexual harassment a white theme, as in Oleana? Is, is loyalty among friends a white theme, as in uh, American Buffalo? I mean, in Shakespeare, for example, is, is an inability to act, is that a white theme? Or is jealousy a white theme in Othello? I think these are universal themes that could be understood by all of us, regardless of our color. Oh, uh, sure, and likewise, when you find that... <laughs> Likewise, when you find them exhibited in black plays, uh, love, honor, duty, betrayal, jealousy, and all these things, you say, these are the universals. But somehow, whites, the implication is that the universal only exists within, within whites. Why is it that blacks have to be free from themselves, from the ghetto of being black, embrace white culture, and then suddenly they're free, and they're not limiting themselves? Black is not limiting. So when you have this situation of white playwrights, as an example, exploring their culture, which is like white culture, no one says to them that they're limiting themselves in that. I would suggest that they're not, and no more than, than I'm limiting myself by exploring black culture, yeah. making a, an investigation of myself, which is what art does. I think Chekhov did that, he investigated Russian culture. Uh, no one says to him, well, you're limiting yourself to Russian, you know, you should write about the more universal. You see, this is part of that. But the reason, the reason why we can do Chekhov is he didn't limit himself to Russian, but he did um, write about uh, the human heart. And uh, well, if nice you get so far are... as you write about the human heart, anybody can Thank do you. your plays. Thank you. But, but my August, would you agree that everyone can do Chekhov? I mean, have we misunderstood the part of your speech that had to do with, with non-traditional casting? No, I, no uh, I don't think any part of my speech here had to do with non-traditional casting because I chose not to bring that up. But if you want to talk about that, we can talk well, about let, that. Let, <laughs> Maybe we should. A lot of people do have questions about that that come in different forms. And, I mean, for example, let's just take it from what Bob said just now about Chekhov. Could a black actor, a uh, Latino actor, Native American actor in this audience, as far as you're concerned, do well by doing the cherry orchard. I, I, I wouldn't embrace them doing that. I, I would much rather uh, that they do uh, art of, that is of their own specific ethnic or racial background. An, an, an example. The, recently there was a production of my play uh, Fences in China. And I... Uh, gave permission to have that production. So, so someone said to me, well, in the stand that you've taken on colorblind casting, how you feel about that? How would you, why is it that you're letting these Chinese people play blacks? And my answer to that was that there wasn't 140 million Africans running around Africa and running around in China trying to participate in theater. 
if you have a situation, as you, if, you, if you will, if you can imagine a situation where you have uh, 240, 264 Chinese theater, you have 160 million Africans in China who want to do theater, and there's four theaters for them in which they can do their plays, and the Chinese say, well, you can come over here and act in our plays. You can come over here and act in our... Chinese classics. You can come over here and pretend that you are Chinese because you, as an African, surely have nothing of value worth exploring in theaters. So you come over here and, 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 and uh, give up your humanity as an African and pretend you're a Chinese. This is the situation that you have here. The initiative for colorblind casting was in, originally it was supposed to provide opportunities for minorities who were otherwise were not in included in those, in, in those roles. And instead, you end up with things like Jonathan Price playing in, in, uh, in Miss Saigon. That's the ends to which colorblind casting has been put to use. You see, I am opposed to it because it denies the individual standing on a stage representing another race of people, denies him his own culture, particularly if that person is standing on a stage uh, and they are not capable or do not have the tools in which to represent themselves. I have a question I, that can just I, Can came. I just okay. reply to that yes, a second? Yes, You see, I think you misunderstand the purpose of colorblind casting. The purpose of colorblind casting was to get the best possible actor in the role, regardless of his race. I, <laughs> I, don't, think that's an, I don't think that's an actor's equity... Uh, actor's equity uh, uh, Initiative. I don't think that's, a, that's the, the, the position that Actors' Equity took uh, when, when they broached the subject. It was to provide roles for minorities in non-traditional roles in which they might otherwise have been cast. That is the spirit in which it was launched. Now it becomes about something else. I have two that I'm going to put one right on top of the other, and I'll let both of you deal with them. One is, no, it's because it's great. These are the kind of questions that mix this all up, okay? I am an actor of mixed cultural heritage. My mother is Jewish of Austrian-Polish descent. My father is black, mixed with a bit of Scots, Irish, and Native American Indian. Both of them were highly involved in CORE in the 1960s, and my father is currently president of a chapter of the NAACP. I was raised in a predominantly Chicano neighborhood in Los Angeles. <laughs> Where does someone with my type of background fit in the American theater? I, I have just sat here and said in no uncertain terms that I make my own definitions. Yes. However that person wants to define themselves, fine. If they define themselves as black, then I think personally that it is wrong for them to participate in, a, in, in the theater uh, acting as someone other than as a, uh, as a black person okay, on the stage. Okay, then that makes a bigger question, which is somewhere in my pile. Please forgive me, the author, because I'm... We'll get back to the debate after a break. This is Fresh Air. Back to the debate on race, cultural power, and theater between playwright August Wilson and critic and director Robert Brustein with moderator Anna DeVere Smith, recorded last week at New York's Town Hall. August, you disagree with black actors playing white roles. How do you feel about gay, lesbian actors? Should they be relegated to playing only queer roles? Uh. I think everyone agrees that sexual preference is different than race. Race is a much larger category than sexual preference. I would, however, be opposed to women playing men and men playing women uh, roles on the stage. In other words, a woman playing a role that's originally written for a man or a man playing a woman originally written for a, a woman. Uh, okay. Okay. Hold it, please. Um, can uh, I, can it's I been, ask if he would yes. object to... Please. To, would he object to women writing about men? Uh, no, I don't object to, no, I don't object to that. Uh, okay. men writing about women? No, I do not object to that. White people writing about black people? I object to that, yes. You're not consistent, obviously. Well, I am very <laughs> consistent. I know what I believe, and I'm, you know, I'm consistent in my beliefs, yes. What, what about... 
<laughs> you know, in your, in your opening remarks, you, you talked about a divide that began with Plato, and you put Plato and Aristotle at opposite ends of the pole. One of the things I was thinking about was, is there another position? Is, does that have to be either or? And has anything happened in all these years to make another position? Has anything happened in America to make another position? Well, there's Brecht's position. Uh, Brecht actually tried to unify him. He hated Aristotle, but he essentially was an Aristotelian himself. Um, Brecht was one of the most activist of playwrights, don't we think so? But if you look at all of Brecht's plays, they all end in a question mark, like all of Ibsen's plays end in an unresolved way, as all of the greatest plays of our time end in an unresolved way. Uh, Good One of Sets You On ends with the word help. I mean, uh, she's being torn in all kinds of directions, and all she can say is help. She hasn't resolved it. Society hasn't resolved her problem. Uh, you may go away thinking you know how to resolve it, but Brecht isn't telling you the way. And that's the, that's the artist in Brecht that recognizes that you know, art really doesn't change anything. It may change consciousness. It's not going to change society. Do you think well, that art changes something? I, I, yes, I think art changes the individual, and the individual changes society. I think that uh, art is... Art is, all art is political in the sense that it serves the politics of someone. But here in America, very often the politics and art is disguised. For instance, there's this rash of movies, uh, and the rage, to, the rage to Kill being one, Mississippi, The Ghost of Mississippi being another, in which these acts of, uh, are, are made to seem as acts of individual, individual racism, which relieves the society of its complicity in those events. So these politics are very, very, the, the, the politics is art, it, it very, it's camouflaged and it's hidden. In the same way, uh, another example being in the movie Crossroads, where you have a little white kid who is going to battle for the black man's soul in lieu of the black man. So, which says, the politics of that says that your, that you, your, your life and your, your everything, your soul, is best left in the hands of someone who is white, no matter if he's a kid or not. And this old man, all his years of living, did not temper his soul to the point that he can go and battle the devil for his own soul. And further, as he battles the devil uh, who's playing a, a rock music, which is a watered-down version of the blues, he cannot defeat him with the blues and has to resort to classical music in order to defeat him. All this is politics. Okay. I, um, I think that statement was politics, and I think that um, the, the drama, theater, theatrical art, has to have two truths. It can't only have one truth. You've been giving us one truth over and over again. It's true, but you've got to oppose it with another truth or else we don't have drama. We've got a monologue. Well, um, and, and, and as I say, those two truths are quite often not resolvable, uh, just like our debate tonight. I mean, we don't seem to be getting anywhere with each other, but, which means that, although we love each other, I think, I hope. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, we're not reconciling it, our it, differences, and I think that's drama too. It, it, now, it, what I consider one of the difficult things about our time is the way we have begun to politicize our culture. Uh, that's because we don't have a politics. We are, we don't have an ideology. We don't have an idea about how to change the society properly. So we go to culture and say maybe culture can do it for us. It can't. All you're going to do is debase and corrupt the culture. Is the funding question not how much well, as I mentioned, the two of you both are dissatisfied with funding strategies. Is the funding question not how much or from whom, but to what purpose? Is it problematic, in other words, for funding institutions to provide seed money to mainstream institutions to develop cultural diversity rather than directly to specifically culturally diverse organizations? Without question. Can you say more? Uh, well, I thought I did, uh, I, and, and this is partly, at least also, my, my, my problem with colorblind casting, in that you're taking uh, uh, black talent, and you're utilizing black talent, and you're empowering black talent, if you will, at the expense of black people, at the expense of black theater, uh, so that, and we have a situation where for instance, and, and some critics are, are, are writing and are saying, 
Well, since there are so many theaters which are doing black plays, is it necessary to have black theaters? You see, because we're, we, we are now involved in the production of black art, so you guys don't need that. You see, and what that does is it puts the custodianship of the art into someone else. And then what are blacks going to do five years from now when they're no longer doing black plays and when they're doing Asian plays or whatever? You see, the whites still maintain control over those institutions, irrespective if you work in them or not. So the initiative of the Lila Wallace Reader Digest initiative, for instance, did a tremendous disservice to blacks. And because it's, one, it said that we were children, we needed someone to be responsible for us, so we're going to give this money to the, the uh, white institutions for multicultural purposes as opposed to giving it to you to develop your own art. Uh, I think that uh, I think it did a uh, disservice to the way art is viewed, black art is viewed, and black theater is viewed, and black people are viewed. Okay. I, and I, I agree what? with that. Uh, it's, it's one of the. I'm glad to be able to find a point of agreement with August tonight. I do agree with that. I think um, uh, that this was a, uh, an unfortunate uh, foundation choice that's been going on now for what 10, 15 years, uh, and to to kind of give money to essentially uh, mainstream. I won't call them white institutions, mixed institutions uh, to uh, just to do black plays or culturally diverse plays. I think you're quite right those, that money should go to black theaters to do black plays. And the mainstream theaters should do those plays because they want to, not because they have grants for it. We'll get back to the debate after a break. This is Fresh Air. Back to the debate on race, cultural power, and theater between playwright August Wilson and critic and director Robert Brustein with moderator Anna DeVere Smith, recorded last week at New York's Town Hall. This is for Mr. Brustein. Do you really believe that standards are universal? Hasn't racism imposed itself on mainstream culture's understanding of what is beautiful, what is important, what is profound, what is meaningful? No. No? <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> I mean, if, you're gonna, if you believe that you are, you know, as, a, as an ethnic or a racial group, entirely separate from the rest of the country, then you probably can make, a, you make that judgment. But the fact is that I think we're all Americans together. Uh, we, we share a common culture. We share many cultures as well. We share uh, some common knowledge as culture, but uh, let me inform you, we are separate. Okay? And, and you, in one of your... Uh, uh, critiques of my speech, you say, what's next? Separate uh, toilets, separate washrooms. And I want to tell you, I don't know the last time you've been to the, the, the Harlem, but above 125th Street, all the toilets are black. And if you go on Park Avenue, all the toilets are white. And you go down to Chinatown, they're Chinese. You see, so that's part of this 13th floor illusion we have that we're all one people. Well, it's true, we share some commonalities in culture, but there's tremendous separation in this society in which you and I both live in. And I think that our failure to recognize that it leads to the cause of which we, we, we will not be able to come up with a remedy for that. Well, August, it's because I'm somewhat older than you that I really grew up in a time when it was uh, our driven desire, all of us, to break down the separation between the races. Uh, and uh, that was our commitment. And uh, to feel that, you know, we have to go back to separate but equal when so much time, effort, and passion was poured into trying to get rid of that so-called concept, which was never uh, separate or equal. It was separate, but it was never equal. Uh, really appalls me. And uh, I think you should rethink that. No, no, we're, no I'm, we're, we're not trying to go back here again. Yeah. We're trying to be included in American society. Yes. You see, but since whites have all the power in the society, they have all the washroom keys, and they're simply not allowing us to participate in the society as Africans, as who we are. Well, I share a washroom with any number of people. <laughs> I don't have any problem. <laughs> we're going to um, have to conclude, and I have this one last question for both of you. Okay, this is the last question for both gentlemen. In his opening remarks, Mr. Brustein expressed the hope that he and Mr. Wilson might learn something from each other this evening. Would Mr. Brustein tell us what he has learned from Mr. Wilson, and would Mr. Wilson tell us what he has learned from Mr. Brustein? Uh, 
I learned that behind Mr. Wilson's anger, he is a teddy bear. <laughs> is that right? I'm right. Sorry. <laughs> I, I consider that doesn't myself. doesn't have any ethnic connotations, does uh, it? <laughs> I consider myself a personable person, uh, yes. Uh, I, uh, but I assure you I'm a lion. <laughs> so you learned that Mr. Wilson is a... I learned, I learned about the qualities of his, of his temperament, and uh, that was uh, good for me. I, I, I had met him only once, and then I read the speech, and I was not prepared to find a man of such, uh, of such quality. And um, I'm, uh, I mean, I'm talking about the temperament now. I'm not talking about his artistic quality. And uh, I'm, uh, I like him. So, how about you, <laughs> August? Uh, I've had enough. I, I was. I, I think Mr. Brewstein in his writing comes across somewhat different than he yeah, does I in his so person. Yeah, I think so too. That's true. And I have a, somewhat the same feelings regarding Mr. Brewstein. Uh, I had in, in, in anticipated and expected someone else. Uh, other than the, the person who showed up here because uh, I, I knew him very briefly. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I was not able to learn much else about the positions which he uh, espouses other than he has already articulated in his books and in his response to my, to, to my speech. Uh, and I would have liked to, uh, but I, I, I didn't learn much else other than what was already there. Uh, so yeah, I think it's fair to say that we haven't moved any any further from from uh, where we. Well, just because you haven't moved from your positions doesn't mean that you haven't learned something more about what is there. Do you I'm, think? <clears throat> I'm confirmed in my notion that drama is the opposition of two ideas, and I think we probably provided drama tonight, if not enlightenment. <laughs> <clears throat> you want to say anything else? Uh, yeah, I think that I, I, yeah, I'd just like to say that uh, that that. Uh, Hope is not always enduring. That sometimes it is bitter with the with the, with the overwrite promise, and we need uh, more theaters to develop uh, our artists. Thank you all so much for being among us. We've been listening to a debate recorded last week at New York's Town Hall between playwright August Wilson and critic and director Robert Brewstein. The moderator was Anna DeVere Smith. We thank them for letting us broadcast their debate. As 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 their debate. And talking about them as artists, not as citizens, not as political beings, have rejected the concept of art as an ideological instrument. Ideological art is dedicated either to reinforcing the existing power structure, as in totalitarian regimes, or reforming and changing it, as in most activist revolutionary expression. The alternative to ideological art was eloquently summed up by the Czech novelist Milan Kundera when he said that his artistic function was to speak truth to power. Isn't that why we revere the greatest dramatists, from Aristophanes to Athol Fugard? And isn't that one of the major reasons we cherish Shakespeare, despite his occasional need to flatter the reigning English monarchs? because they had the courage to speak truth to power. Such truth-tellers help to expose the corruptions of pomp and power by revealing the reality behind human action and human motive. In short, the workings of the human soul, which has no color. The great black writer James Baldwin has been evoked already tonight. I'd like to evoke him as well. He was a friend of mine who said, at least in his early career, that he believed in speaking... Theater critic for the New Republic and artistic director of the American Repertory Theater in Cambridge, Massachusetts. If I understand August Wilson's position correctly, he regards theater partly as an avenue to political and cultural power, a medium through which a large, disadvantaged class can dramatize its past injustices and perhaps find redress through changes in the social or political system. 
Starting with Plato, who you know banished the artist from his ideal republic, utopianists, even the best of them, have usually ended in suppressing free artistic expression. All revolutions, as Eugene Ionesco wrote, burn the libraries of Alexandria. Today in America, we see a similar leaning in what we call political correctness, which in its overzealous crusade to purge our language of offensive terms, sometimes seems to be arguing for what one critic has called freedom from speech. <laughs> Out of a conviction that freedom of speech is essential to creative invention and critical thought, a number of modern artists, both black and white, whatever their beliefs as citizens of the state, and I must continue to emphasize that political art is usually a persuasive form of melodrama, the opposition of right and wrong, or shall we say black and white, when the truth is usually gray. I agree with August Wilson's appeal for more black theaters and with his plea that foundations be more supportive of such theaters, assuming they have established records. This is certainly a better cause for foundations than pouring their multi multicultural funds into efforts to diversify the audiences of mainstream theaters. In fact, I believe strongly in general operating grants from public and private sources for all theaters of proven quality. But this support cannot be viewed as a form of entitlement. Black theaters should earn their foundation and corporate funding by the same criteria of value and community support as any other. If Mr. Wilson knows of a worthy black theater that isn't being properly funded, he could give it instant recognition by rewarding it with one of his world premieres. Although I endorse the value of theaters that confine themselves to plays by black writers, I admit some difficulty in approving Mr. Wilson's appeal for the self-segregation of black artists in racial enclaves, in truth to power as well. In an essay called Everybody's Protest Novel, he wrote, let us say that truth is meant to imply a devotion to the human being. It is not to be confused with a devotion to a cause and causes, as we know, are notoriously bloodthirsty. Note that neither Kundera nor Baldwin seems much interested here in using the artistic process to achieve power. Indeed, behind their words is the implication that the true artist must shun power, because power systems are not only not instruments of truth, they may very well be the enemies of truth. Those who believe in art as a political weapon, as a method of empowering the disadvantaged, no doubt serve a vital social function, but sometimes at a cost. A passionate political purpose occasionally obliges these artists, in my opinion, to sacrifice individual truth for the collective good. Of course, it is possible to justify such means if the right ends are achieved. But look at the downside. While the arts at best are inclusive, ideological art is exclusive. The spectator is pressured to reach conclusions, coerced into choosing sides. This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. The 1990s seem to be proving what W.E.B. Du Bois predicted back in 1903, that race relations would be the central problem of the 20th century. We see racial controversies in politics, the justice system, education, and even the arts. Last week, before a full house at New York's Town Hall, the esteemed theater critic Robert Brustein, who is white, and Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright August Wilson, who is African-American, debated racial politics in American theater. If you follow the arts, you've probably read about it. Now you can hear it for yourself. The event, entitled On Cultural Power, was sponsored by American Theatre Magazine, which is published by the Theatre Communications Group, an organization that represents nonprofit theaters. The debate was moderated by playwright and performer Anna DeVere Smith. Brustein and Wilson's public disagreement began after Wilson's address at a Theatre Communications Group conference last June. 
Wilson pointed to the lack of African-American theater companies and claimed that only African-Americans are equipped to write or direct theater about African-Americans. Furthermore, he said that African-Americans betray their cultural identity when they perform in so-called colorblind roles. Brustein responded in print by condemning what he described as Wilson's poisonous racial consciousness. We'll hear excerpts of last week's opening remarks from Brustein and Wilson, followed by their responses to questions from the audience. First, Robert Brustein 